Meet Nick Lane, evolutionary biologist at the University College London. Look at those eyebrows. <laughs> Nick is an expert in mitochondria, and he's written several books. He's written about oxygen, the molecule that made the world. And then he's written about power, sex, and suicide, mitochondria, and the meaning of life in 2005. He's also written two other books. One is Life Ascending, The Ten Great Inventions of Evolution, and The Vital Question, Why is Life the Way It Is? I sat down with Nick here in my office at ANU, and we discussed, are we alone? I'm uh, Professor Nick Lane uh, from <laughs> University College London. All right, and what are you a specialty? What are you an expert in? Uh, broadly in bioenergetics, uh, which is to say the energy of life uh, and why it's such a peculiar mechanism. It's not something anybody would have guessed. So I, I, I've kind of followed that right back to the beginning, to the origins of life. How did uh, the, the, the kind of energy that powers life arise? Okay, and uh, Nick, are we alone in the universe? I hope not. You hope not? All right. I imagine that there'll be plenty of bacteria out there. The, why do you hope that we're not alone? Um, because, because you're because so I no because I think that the, the, there should be some principles governing the origin of life, and it seems to me that they shouldn't be that difficult. From what I know about the origin of life on this planet, so carbon chemistry, water, the kind of reactions, hydrogen, CO two, none of it seems too difficult. So in principle, and this, why else would you bother studying the origin of life if you thought it was impossibly difficult to start? You know, you do well, it in the lab. People study the origin of English, but no one hopes yes. that there are English speakers elsewhere. Uh, yeah, and I don't expect to find an English speaker elsewhere. Right, either, so but, yet uh, people study English. Yes, I, I'm studying the origin of life because I would like to come up with a way of, of, of trying to demonstrate in the lab in a fairly short period of time what are the principles underpinning the emergence of life, at least on Earth, and I would like to think that those principles are generalizable in some way, uh, and therefore it's kind of important to me, I suppose, in that sense, that, that those principles shouldn't be extremely difficult. Now, you say you would like to believe that they're uh, generalizable, but you also suspect that they are. I suspect they are. It's not yes. just a hope. You, you <laughs> no, have it's not good, a hope. You I, have think, some... I think they are, but I'm also aware that I'm wrong about a lot. Okay, so what is the best evidence you have that these principles that we think are behind the origin of life on Earth are behind, would be behind the origin of life elsewhere? Well, <clears throat> it's, it's thinking about the nature of life on Earth and whether or not that makes sense more generally. So does it make sense that life is cellular? Would you expect to find life being cellular elsewhere? And viruses, of course, are okay. Let's know, stop and ask you that question. Alive, but... Okay, let's stop and think about that question. Yeah. What's the? What do you think is the answer? I suspect that for organic life, yes, it would. It would tend to be cellular. Why couldn't you have viruses, as in, I guess, the Martin and Coonan two thousand and five article that you talked about? About you can have viruses that are not parasitic on any pre-existing cellular life, but on the pre-existing, I guess, rock uh, free energy gradient. It's possible for that. Um, I liked that paper a great deal when I first read it. I've gone off it a little bit since then, not for the paper itself, but because of the, what, the perception of how life would start in vents, taking over open pores. Um, it seems to me, well, we tried to model some stuff and uh, we're, we're, trying to, we're trying to model I don't want to get too technical on this, but whether or not it would be possible to drive the kind of protein machinery that you see in modern cells, like an ATP synthase, for example, that makes the energy currency of life. And the question is, well, if it were just sitting there in a membrane in a vent, can we work out whether the, the natural gradients, the iron gradients in these vents would be enough, powerful enough to drive th this machine to work? And, and, and you start thinking, well, what do we need to know here? Well, you need to know what are the substrates, what are the, what are, what are the materials that it needs to operate? Where are they coming from? What's the concentration of them? You realize you have no answer to any of those. And then what's the product? Well, it, it disappears off somewhere else as well. So how can selection act if you've got stuff coming in from some unknown place and, le and the products are leaving to some unknown place? It made me realize that cellularization is important uh, as a way of keeping the inside in and keeping the outside out. Uh, and, and so I, I now have problems with the idea of seeing the entire vent as a kind of a living system. Do you have a working definition of life that you use? But 
Or no, I, I deliberately avoid having one. Uh, what, I, what I quote to a lot of people is a, is a lovely quote from Peter Mitchell, uh, who was a, a pioneer, not really of the origin of life field, but of, of, of this idea of membrane bioenergetics, that, uh, that essentially all cells, with very, very few exceptions, are powered by usually proton gradients across the membrane. So on one side of the, the membrane surrounding the cell, you've got a high proton uh, concentration on the inside, a low proton concentration. Protons are, of course, the, the positively charged nuclei of hydrogen atoms, so they've, they've got a positive charge. You're pumping them out and you're putting a charge on the membrane too. That's as universally conserved across life on Earth as the genetic code itself, which implies as a mechanism it's very early. And it's not something anyone ever predicted. It's not something that kind of emerges from a chemical understanding of the, the biochemistry of cells. Do you think that was the first energy currency preceding ATP? Yes, I think so. Now, so, do you, so what do you think that you say a proton gradient? What about sodium or calcium or other it ions? Could that be, could easily... It could be any of those. The fact on, of life on Earth is it tends to use proton gradients, and we know particular environments that do use proton gradients. And the reason I think protons um, is because pH, which is to say the proton concentration, can modulate the reactivity of both carbon dioxide and hydrogen. Now, sodium concentration wouldn't do that. Oh. But protons, if you've got hydrogen gas in alkaline fluids, hydrothermal fluids, which is what you get coming out of these hydrothermal vents, um, hydrogen is more reactive in alkaline conditions. It really doesn't want to push its electrons onto something else. But if it's in alkaline conditions, it pushes its electrons onto something else, and the protons are left behind, they will react immediately with the hydroxide ions to form water, which is thermodynamically very favored. And so it's far more likely to push its electrons onto CO2 if it's in alkaline solution. Now, CO2 itself, it doesn't really want to pick up any electrons and become reduced to an organic molecule. But if it's in a relatively acidic environment where there's protons available, it picks up a, a negative charge, it doesn't want another negative charge. It's going to try and repel that. But if there's a proton around, it picks up the proton. Now it's neutralized the charges, pick up another electron, another proton. So it's much easier to accept electrons in an acidic environment. And this is the structure of these vents, and it's the structure of cells, and it's how these earliest, most ancient cells we know about actually do uh, fix CO2. They use the proton channel in the membrane, which effectively locally acidifies an environment and allows this reaction to proceed. So I think that's fundamental, simple, work, works well, and it's, it, it's testable in the lab. You think that the step from back prokaryotes to eukaryotes, I guess an endosymbiotic event, which is a, what you described as a topological event, you think that is quirky or rare enough so that we should not expect eukaryotes or complex morphology elsewhere? I wouldn't say statistically it, it happened here. I don't think we have a statistical basis. What I would say is that I wouldn't expect populations of bacteria to give rise without endosymbiosis to complex morphology and the kind of intelligence that we have elsewhere. I think that it would require, I'm going out on a limb here, but I think it requires an endosymbiosis for the reasons I've been saying, and that that endosymbiosis is A, rare, and B, likely to go wrong. So I can't put a number on how improbable it is, it's just that I would say that it, it, it's, a, it's a factor that a lot of people would rather not think about. If you have an agenda where you'd like to find complex life out there, the SETI people, for example, probably don't really want to hear this kind of stuff. Um, it, it says that it's less likely, it's not an inevitable outcome of, of physics. So is this eukaryotic bottleneck your favorite solution to Fermi's paradox? I think there's plenty of solutions to Fermi's paradox that we don't need to add this as an extra one, but yes, it would be my favorite explanation for it, that there is no inevitability about complex life, that there's nothing in the laws of cosmology that say life will start. I think there probably is something in the laws of cosmology lending itself towards bacteria, uh, but the idea of more complex life, I certainly wouldn't see a Simon Conway Morris view, for example, that that uh, the origin of life is so complex that you require God to, to, to put everything in motion and then convergent evolution will take you all the way to humans. Do you think there is an intelligence niche into which some other creature would evolve? There plainly is an intelligence niche because we're in it. Do I think that there's an inevitability about it being filled? No, I think it's more likely it would not be filled. Um, now, when you say a niche, it usually implies something general. For example, 
the English language is very specific. No one would talk about an English language niche, right? And so my view of human-like intelligence is so narrow, it's more like the English language. But most people think, oh, no, there's, it's much more generic than that. Where, where do you Well, when stand? I'm talking about a human-like intelligence, I'm thinking of post-biology. I'm thinking of creation of Technology. technologies that, are, uh, that, that, that go beyond anything that humans can do now. So then the question is, well, can a dolphin do that? Can, a, can an ape do that? Can, a, can an octopus do it? Maybe not now, but let's take the humans out and give another two billion years. Two billion? It's, is it going to happen in that two billion year time? Well, we, you know, we've, we've had, since the Cambrian explosion, 550 million years. It's only happened once and quite recently. Uh, we've had pretty sophisticated animals around a lot of that time. So I certainly wouldn't see any inevitability about it. I have a feeling, but I don't know, I don't work on this, but I have a feeling that there were a, a bunch of unusual factors during early human evolution which nudged us in this particular direction. Well, the question is, how unusual? Again, it's a numbers game because we're talking about uh, human-like intelligence we're elsewhere. Back to, we're back to conjuring with, a, with, a, with, a, with an N of one, so it's hard to know, isn't it? 